Live on the Superstation, it's America's podcast, Battle of the Network Shows. Battle of the Network Shows. Join Rick Brooks and Mike Kogel as they explore the TV of the 70s and 80s through hand-picked episodes of their favorite and not-so-favorite series. Welcome to Battle of the Network Shows. I'm Mike. I'm here with Rick. Hey, everybody. And today we're doing something unprecedented. We're going to talk about an entire channel rather than one show. Yes, we are. We've never done this before. No. So maybe you can explain a little bit where we got the idea and what we're going to try to do is is definitely an experiment. The channel we're going to talk about is distinctive enough and there's enough about it that ties in kind of like the history of television in the 70s and 80s that we think maybe it's appropriate that we could devote kind of a whole episode and it'll give us a chance to talk about things we wouldn't otherwise have talked about necessarily. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, our friend of the show, Ian, loaned us some archival material that we used last season for a couple of our episodes. And one of the pieces of archival material that he loaned us had a variety of different programs, but one was a show called Tush, which is a sketch comedy with uh, Bill Tush, who was mm-hmm. kind of like the, the on-air face of Turner Broadcasting System for a while. For TBS. a long time. And, or people might remember him from being the host of CNN Showbiz Today mm-hmm. for yeah. quite a while. Yeah, so he was there from like the the real early days of Turner, like in the early satellite days, probably. And this this is a real kind of curio to me. I didn't know anything about this show, but uh, yeah. it's a sketch comedy show that was late night on TBS. Didn't last real long, but had a, accumulated a pretty good amount of episodes. It was like a weekly thing, and I was uh, watching this and thought, you know, hey, why don't we talk about this? But instead of talking about just a show. Let's use this as a springboard to talk about TBS in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, we started talking a little bit about kind of our memories of TBS and and what it meant. And to me, at least, as somebody that grew up in, you know, more the Northeast, it wasn't like a local channel to me, but it was Superstation TBS. And I never knew it until it was Superstation TBS. Right. And it was kind of like, okay, this is what cable TV is. It's not just, you know, these real small channels. It's it's big channels like this that have all kinds of stuff on it that I want to watch. So that's kind of where where we're coming from and why we're going to talk about, like, uh, the original programming, the sports, like everything that was TBS Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the 70s and 80s, I think. And my relationship with it is totally different because I grew up near Atlanta, and it was the local one of the local channels. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was a UHF channel. Now, looking at the dates, I think it was becoming, starting its cable ascendancy, like, around the time we moved there. Hmm. But, I mean, we didn't have cable until 81, I think. And then my dad would periodically get rid of cable because... He didn't want to pay for it or he's fed up with it for some reason. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we always had Channel 17. That was, it, for us, it was Channel 17. Yeah. And I guess I could start there and just talk about sure. some of my memories of it because it was, we actually had three UHF channels, like independent UHF channels. So the, the main cha- the the VHF, I'm sure people remember this stuff, the different ways you can get it on the antenna. There was Channel 2, which was uh, ABC, and Channel 5, which was CBS then. I think it's Fox now. And Channel 11 as was NBC. There was also the PBS, which I think was 8. And then Channel 17, Channel 36, and Channel 46. So Channel 46 was the place where a lot of like syndicated cartoons would be and syndicated sitcoms but also a lot of reruns and movies and similar things to 17 36 i don't remember much about it was harder to get and i think it was like the the dregs of things Mm. and then of course 17 was the powerhouse and and also the home of the braves and the hawks and the hockey team when they were around the flames um but like i made a list of of just things i remember seeing on there so the big one was the cartoon cartoon block they would have in the morning like before school and it was just uh, you know, a, a lot of places would have like a, like Bozo or some, you know, some host for yeah. the, this is just a bunch of stuff strung together r- randomly. Which is awesome. Yeah. And so it'd be Looney Tunes, I guess the Looney Tunes only up to a certain point, but those are the good Looney Tunes. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, up to the late forties or something. Uh, Tom and Jerry, Old Popeye, just, a, you know, random other MGM cartoons, those other like super weird ones you see with a lot of like, I don't know, just like clocks and 
chemistry sets and <laughs> you know the things that aren't tied to a character yeah. or a brand. But then that same block also included Three Stooges and Little Rascals slash Our Gang. So <laughs> yeah, it it was great. Yeah. I don't even think it had a name for a lot of the time. I think it was, here it is. Yeah. And and that, I think that was on in the afternoon, too. But then they also had, like, in the afternoon, they would have the Flintstones and the Jetsons and some of the other, like, the Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound type Hanna-Barbera cartoons. Mm-hmm. Deputy Dog, I think, was on sometimes. And Woody Woodpecker and Chili Willie and those. I seem to remember being there being some sort of other block of those kind of, the the ones that would have that, what was it, AAAP logo? Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, you know. the repackaged uh, yeah. Warner Brothers. Uh, and so those might have been some of the like the later, those sort of 50s, those Popeye that were done by different people, and, mm-hmm. um, stuff like that. There was also a period where they had, well, there was a Battle of the Planets, which was a, you know, a Japanese import that was repackaged uh, for the U.S. Space Giants, which is one of the, like a, I forget what they call that, but a, one of those things with people, you know, dressed up as monsters and robots. And, and then another one called Spectre Man that was like that. So like the Power Rangers kind of thing, but in the 70s. And then, of course, I Love Lucy, Beverly Hillbillies, Leave it to Beaver, Brady Bunch, Bewitched, Family Affair, Ozzy and Harriet, Father Knows Best, uh, a lot of PSAs, a lot of mail order things. So records. Hmm. Uh, I remember Slim Whitman. Hmm. Wow. And, and Con- your boy Conway Chody. Yeah. Uh, Mickey Gilly, I think, was a big one. <laughs> but also, like, products, uh, uh, you know, Ginsu knives and all that kind of stuff. And uh, just the the mail-away things. And probably some local commercials, I'm sure. That, mm-hmm. You know, at some point when they were became the Superstation, I, I, at some point they allowed the local carrier to put in their own ads mm-hmm. in those spots. But there was, uh, I think, Sanford and Son was on there a lot. The Munsters, the Adams Family. And... I didn't watch it, but the wrestling, you'll probably talk about that a little bit. And oh, that Starcade, mm. the video game game show. What was the music video show there? Night Tracks. Night Tracks, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one show you didn't mention there, which is a show that I associate with TBS, is yeah. Andy Griffith. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah, forgot to write that down. That's kind of like a like a given almost. That, yeah. That was like a <laughs> staple, right, of TBS for years. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and, and a lot of old movies. I don't know how much we watched them, but it certainly was. That and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but to me, like just looking at that and thinking about those different things, you can see the future of the different Turner cable networks sort of broken up or all in one place. Mm-hmm. But you can see the idea of Cartoon Network is there, yeah, and the idea of TCM is there in a way, right? Not so much TNT, <laughs> well, or TB, in but a way, in a way, I mean, the packaging they just like at this point, TBS is sort of branded comedy and TNT is branded drama or right. whatever the deal is but and, tnt like had movies and sports was a big part of early tnt yeah. and that was something else that was big on tbs yeah exactly and it, i think like in the mid-70s was when they were able to go national and just b- buy satellite time and, and beam all over the place yeah. although they start out with like i was looking like four almost random cities right and we're not large metropolitan areas but gradually as cable became bigger because they were allowed to, to beam in signals from other places, TBS became a very attractive option for yeah. people in other areas. Now, apparently, I mean, it was, even before that, it was it had a regional presence. Like, they were able to beam it in some other way, not through a satellite, but through some sort of microwave signal to regional in the south. So it was, I think the Braves were the team in the south even before yeah. they hit cable because smaller markets didn't have independent channels to carry stuff, which is why it succeeded as a cable channel too i think partially because a lot of areas didn't they had cable but they didn't have their own little network little channel like that right like uh for me when i was growing up like a lot of the programs you mentioned i got on other channels yeah i think it must have been like maybe late 85 early 1986 is probably when i got tbs as superstation tbs by then it was Mm -hmm. i mean originally it was wtcg right and there's some people that say it stood for watch this channel grow yeah (laughs) But he changed it to W Ted Turner, yeah, the the founder of it, you know, started changed it to WTBS for Turner Broadcasting System, and so when I got it, it was fully formed as this uh, super station with pretty much everything that a national audience uh, came to to know and expect from it. Yeah, but I think then then shortly after that, they became like they changed some of the rules so that you couldn't duplicate programming on other other stations. Like for example, like Andy Griffith, I think at the time 
like in the mid 80s it could be on like three or four different channels but mm. then they made some rule where it would have to be blacked out if somebody else had like the exclusive rights to it right and you'd have all these other deals which would make like which made a station like that kind of obsolete yeah although on the other hand like now you don't have like the syndication as much so <laughs> it's kind of a moot point anyway yeah, you can have criminal minds on yeah 15 channels right or and you don't have like local channels I mean, maybe they'll show, like, on Saturday nights, you'll see, like, Criminal Minds, like, 1130 yeah. against, like, Saturday Night Live or something like that. But you don't have, like, these blocks. You have, like, news right. and stuff like that in the local channels. And you don't have, like, independent channels. I mean, TBS was, like, an independent channel that had its own flavor, the yeah. southern flavor that became, like, this national this national channel. You got to give Ted Turner credit because he was the one that, that kind of saw this. And he, he does deserve a lot of credit, I think, for the rise of cable. Right. And he made a lot of things possible. After HBO, it was the second satellite channel like that. Yeah. And he took his father's billboard business and invested in television yep. against uh, people's advice and, and wound up uh, building kind of a, a little empire with it. And just to fast forward to the present, uh, yeah, now it's, it's branded as comedy. It's a totally different it's, – it's totally corporate when right. Time Warner bought, bought it out and Ted Turner kind of like e was eased out of it like in the mid-'90s. It it lost its its identity. It's not the same. Yeah. It never will be, but it's kind of nice to think back of, of like a, a station that had all this cool stuff, cool stuff at original programming, had it, its flavor and it had like this charismatic uh, kind of maverick owner at the head of it and Ted Turner. And right. that's the kind of thing you just don't see anymore. Ted Turner is an interesting dude. Yeah. I mean, of course being Atlanta, he was it's sort of like people in the New York, New Jersey area being very cognizant of Trump before maybe other people were nationally, but you know, he was the billionaire in town. Yeah. And, and of course, he owned the two big sports teams, two of the three big sports teams. Yeah, the uh, the Braves and the Hawks. And yeah. it was very smart because at the time, I mean, he, he was putting like 100-some, like tons of Braves games on TV. Right. Which, you know, the Braves were terrible when you were growing <laughs> up for most of the time, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> they didn't didn't really get good until like the, the early 90s. but Right, right. when, I, I guess, when he stopped meddling. Yeah. <laughs> But it was still baseball. Yeah. And at the time, like, uh, you know, growing up, there was, like, the, the game of the week on NBC. Maybe you'd get, like, Monday – or NBC had the Saturday game of the week. Yeah. ABC would have, like, Monday night baseball for right. a while. But you didn't have, like, this saturation. Even your local team wouldn't necessarily be on TV all that much. Yeah. And if you didn't have a local team, I mean, if you're, like, in Arkansas or, you know, all kinds of places now, baseball – Major League Baseball has these ridiculous blackout rules. So if you leave those out of it, Somebody like North Carolina, you know, Florida. I mean, these places didn't have teams then. And they didn't, not only just baseball teams, they didn't have like other sports, professional sports teams. They had maybe college sports. So the Braves, they, they, Ted Turner started calling them like America's team. Right. And they kind of were just because they were on TV everywhere. Yeah. Like so many different places that didn't have a team could, could kind of watch, even if it was crummy baseball, at least it was baseball they had. Yeah. Like I remember thinking that was weird. Yeah. Because I didn't understand why they were calling him yeah. America's team and, and they except for one season they stunk yeah like right. the Dallas Cowboys were going to the Super Bowl like every other year oh, yeah the the Atlanta Braves were, were not good but they were ubiquitous I guess they just yeah they were everywhere and yeah going into a lot of these areas especially in the south they, they would were definitely the team of the south I guess so and, it was a smart yeah. move to, to buy them and, and put them as, as inventory for his, his cable television channel and the the other super stations the other two big ones were also home of teams that, in general, were crappy. Yeah, you're talking about WGN, the Cubs. Cubs. Of course, they had a, that one good season. And and the Mets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the WOR. WOR. And they had, like, one good season, right? Yeah, well, yeah, they had, they had a couple of good, yeah, That's basically. <laughs> yeah, right around the, not too far long from each other, but yeah. Yeah. That's definitely the case. I, th I think the Braves, I think they were on more than any... Anybody else? I think the other ones had limits because, like, the Mets didn't own WR, for right. example. Okay. Whereas Ted Turner, you know, he was willing to put his team on, like, you know, every day, pretty much, and yeah. much to my detriment sometimes because Braves baseball would interrupt stuff that that I would want to watch. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I prepared a little dossier on uh, Ted Turner. Uh huh. Uh, would you Would you care to play this uh, this game we prepared right now? It's uh, <laughs> sure. Ted Turner fact or fiction? Okay. Okay, I'm going to read off some things about Ted Turner, and you're going to tell me if it's fact or fiction. Mm -hmm. All right, first. His favorite movie is Gone with the Wind, and he once tried to decolorize it and then recolorize it to make it more appealing to modern audiences. <laughs> is that This seems like a trick question. Fact or fiction? <laughs> I believe it started out as fact, and then it drifted into something less than fact. You were correct. His yeah. favorite movie is Gone with the Wind, 
uh, and he was known for colorizing movies and became a very controversial thing. However, he did not try to decolorize yes. Gone with the Wind. And Gone with the Wind, if I remember correctly, uh, once he purchased the MGM library, was in constant, was playing at a theater in the Omni mm. or CNN Center, like all the time. Really? Like it was on, just on that screen. Yeah. Gone with the Wind was the first movie it premiered TNT when that premiered like in 1988. It started with a screening of Gone with the Wind. That's right. And TNT was partly, uh, it had rights to the MGM film library and some other things and TNT was kind of a way to, to show off that whole library. So, yeah. yeah. But Gone with the Wind is his favorite movie. All right, uh, next. After being suspended from Major League Baseball for tampering, he focused on sailing and led the craft Courageous to the America's Cup in 1977 as underdogs. Uh, it's a fact. That is fact, yes. There was a lot, lot going on there, but he was suspended as a Braves owner and had to step away from day-to-day management of the team and got really into uh, yacht, yachting. Did you see that he has a long simmering feud with Rupert Murdoch that stems back to the <laughs> America's Cup? Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, now apparently they did bury the hatchet at one point, I guess. Oh. Uh, disappointing, yes. But yeah, he and Rupert Murdoch used to have a, a big, uh, I think it was mostly coming from Ted Turner. Probably. <laughs> you don't hear Rupert Murdoch kind of going out in public and saying things like trashing other people. But Ted Turner, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I could have just yeah. made a list of quotes and Asked you if they were real or right, not with yeah. Ted Turner. Most of them would be. Uh, yeah, I imagine Rupert Murdoch does it in more subtle Yeah. I ways. mean, well, Ted Turner's got that thing of like, like in Atlanta, yes, he was, you know, he was known there. But he, he's kind of like the outsider. He was unrepentant about his accent. He kind of had like the new money air about him and mm-hmm. like kind of like outside of the establishment and had a, a big mouth. Yep. And was had that just air of being willing to take on everybody and was not shy about self-promoting. So yeah. yes, that was fact. That was a big deal back then. America's cup. I, that, that's kind of vanished now, but I think yeah. sp- then and even back in the eighties, I remember that like that was a big thing on ESPN America's cup, Dennis Connor, and <laughs> the United States trying to get back the America's cup from like New Zealand. Okay. Next as owner of the Atlanta Hawks, he once fired his head coach and began to coach the team himself. Not, not fact. Correct. That was a trick. He did that as owner of the, the Braves, Braves. <laughs> and he managed the team until Major League Baseball told him to, to cut it out. <laughs> he, I think officially he had the manager take like a vacation, but he was Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1991. I'll go with fact. That is fact. And the part of the reason they gave it was essentially for the rise of CNN, which is his, his all cable news network that he created. Yep. And 1991 was the time of the Gulf War and the, the ba- bombings in Baghdad. Right. And uh, some other things that, that I forgot about when I was looking at why time gave it, like the Clarence Thomas uh, hearings, mm. uh, William Kennedy Smith trial, and uh, just a couple of other things going on in CNN was kind of at the heart of this, really with without any competition and 24-hour cable news. Yeah. So largely uh, CNN was what gave him that, that accomplishment. Okay. He once asked pitcher Andy Messersmith to wear – Number 17 on his jersey and call himself Channel to promote TBS, but Major League Baseball vetoed it. Uh, this is the most diabolical one yet. <laughs> so, uh, Channel 17 on the back yeah. of the jersey. I'm going to go with fact on that. That, I, it, that is a fact, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. He, he, he asked him to do it. I'm not sure how far it got, but yeah. uh, before they even got it to it, uh, baseball said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, channels it rolls off the tongue more than Messersmith, you got to admit. Yeah. I... <laughs> Pretty clever. <laughs> All right. As owner of World Championship Wrestling, he was once clotheslined by Nikita Koloff in a memorable angle on television. I'm going to say no. Correct. That is also fiction. Uh, it was actually announcer David Crockett uh, that was clotheslined in that, that angle. And Ted Turner did, for years, wrestling was on uh, his network, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But he was rarely on camera and really wasn't even mentioned that much. And this was a little bit before he was kind of more of a figure in world championship wrestling anyway. So, no. All right. He once gave $1 billion to the Nature Conservancy. Fact. That is fiction. Oh. Trick question. He Twice. placed it to the United Nations. Oh, okay. Not the Nature Conservancy. Although he did become a big advocate for ecology, yeah. wildlife, and uh, similar issues. Next, he said he came closest to running for president in 2000, but he uh, decided not to when his then-wife Jane Fonda 
said she was against it. So in 2000, he would have run against, uh, I think he would have run as a Democrat against uh, George Bush. Mm, I'll go with fact on that. That's a fact. I mean, I'm not sure how true that is, but he has said that he considered it. And is it really that hard to believe that he would no, have considered it? No, it's not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe he didn't do it again or before, actually. If, if he weren't 80 years old and suffering from some health issues, yes. uh, it would, wouldn't shock me if he showed up. All right, two more left here. And you're doing excellent in this, by the way, I might add. He created TNT as a strategy to shift money around in anticipation of a divorce. Uh, I'm going to go with n- not fact. Correct, that's fiction. Uh, the timing time frame was similar, and he did uh, have a divorce uh, around that mm-hmm. time. But no, it was basically just to take advantage of this film library that he had and expand the Turner Broadcasting Empire. Okay, finally, in 1984, he created Cable Music Channel to compete with MTV, but then sold it to MTV about a month later. I'll go with fact. That is true. It launched in October of 1984. It was done by the end of November 1984. (laughs) And this is before my time. I don't have any memory of this, but uh, there are clips uh, that exist. Uh, There's a real cool one... uh, that we'll put on the, on the YouTube playlist for this episode of Ted himself, uh, like kind of pushing a big button and symbolically starting the channel. But he gives a little speech talking about how they're going to stay away from like the gratuitous uh, sex and violence that, that MTV seems to go for. Uh, and, and they're going to be like more family friendly and that the, there's room sure. for another one. So MTV kind of took the, the shell of that and turned it into VH1. So he was indirectly responsible for VH1. Huh. And he offered it with, there were no carriage fees. So he offered it for free to cable systems. And I think the idea was mainly like, I think cable systems wanted some leverage against MTV, which was very popular at the time. Yeah. Probably able to, to command pretty high car- carriage fees. Interesting. I, I have a bonus one for you. Oh, please. Fact or fiction. My dad was a big Ted Turner fan. Fiction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite, I would guess. Yeah. <laughs> he thought he was a, a loud mouth. In it. He was right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, obnoxious, loudmouth. Possibly, maybe he thought he was a drunk. I don't know. Mm, mm. I don't know if he was. I think he had one or two incidents in public where he said things that were maybe he shouldn't have. But yeah, he did that when he was sober too. So <laughs> right, exactly. So who knows? So so uh, yes, yeah, thanks for playing. But we, right there, even without directly talking about TBS, there were all these things that that the founder was involved in, and we talked about whole other networks and yeah, whole things. I mean, man, what a I mean, he's a, a life. fascinating guy. Yeah. In some cases, he's responsible for kind of things that maybe someone else probably would have invented CNN. I don't really care for much for cable news the way it is now yeah. and how it's affected broadcast news. But you can see the intelligence of doing it, though, yeah. at least in retrospect. I read that he, his his position on sort of media consolidation has changed, and he's he thinks it's uh, not a positive thing anymore, even though you could argue he's one of the people who pushed yeah. pushed it into being that, that way. But... Uh, you know, right. a lot of a lot of obviously a lot of foresight on his part. Yeah, he himself survived like at least one takeover bid. I think uh, there was talk of like Westinghouse in the eighties, and Ooh. and there was something with CBS. And I think he, he actually tried, tried to, to buy, buy CBS, CBS at yeah. one time. And man, imagine how the world would have changed if that had happened. But and somehow, and I guess he bought he bought all of MGM, but then he didn't have enough money. So that's why he, he just ended up with the library. Yeah, I think I think he he didn't have quite enough money, and he would have had to put a debt. A lot of debt, and some of his backers kind of like double crossed him, I think, a little yeah. bit. And so, but he wound up keeping like probably the most valuable parts of it. Right. Like the film library that he's used in perpetuity. Yeah. Well, till it was bought up. Right. Obviously, we're not, we wouldn't be fans of colorization, but he kind of got over that pretty quickly. He did, yeah. And then TCM started before he sold to Warner, right? Yes. And, and of course, the mission of TCM is to preserve everything. Right. As is. I mean, that's that's maybe, to many people, just the fact that TCM got starred under his watch would, you know, make it a worthwhile, <laughs> worthwhile career. Because that, that is the one thing that, that is still pretty, fairly pure right now. But, yeah, I mean, and he seemed to have a genuine love for the old movies. Mm-hmm. And his argument was that, well, we can restore them by doing this and more people will see them and, and people don't want to watch black and white movies. And at the time, it was considered absurd. And I think the idea of watching Casablanca in color is ridiculous. And it's kind of yeah. like, you can make speeches about dumbing down in America. But sadly, he's right in the sense that like there are a lot of people that won't even look at a black and white movie. Sure. And the colorization technology now is much better than it was back then, though, too. <laughs> right. But it looked pretty garish, uh, some of the early efforts. Yeah. All I had seen of Casablanca before I actually watched it was a little bit of the colorization. Mm. I remember Sam having like a yellow jacket on. Mm. But that 
vest, but yeah. it's, which I'm sure it's not. I'm, it's probably a white yeah. tuxedo jacket. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean that, and like the Three Stooges, I think were yeah. early yeah. colorization, and, and but Ted Turner somehow became linked to that. He was like the most outspoken advocate and right. putting his money behind it, and that that was probably not something that held on. But you're right, he didn't. He abandoned that. He didn't. He moved on from it. I mean, he he wasn't successful in everything he did for sure. But I mean, TBS was enormously successful, and and several years into it going national, he was they were making really good money. I think. Yeah, his uh, attitude in general, I think, is probably a, of trying different things and being a maverick, and that makes it interesting, but sometimes frustrating. But like like Bill Tosh, who we're gonna uh, we already mentioned, but you know that I think that was before they went national, but they had like a you know they had to have a news program of some kind, so they had it on at like three in the morning, and <laughs> yeah. it was sort of like a he would broadcast with a dog and yeah a guy with a paper sack on his head yeah. <laughs> It was basically a comedy show right. that had just enough news in it to, I guess, help satisfy the FCC. Although I did watch a YouTube, it was like a, uh, you know, a bunch of commercials, and that one did have news breaks in it. It was like a Sunday afternoon because they kept talking about what was happening in the NFL and mm-hmm. these news breaks. Mm-hmm. But still, I kind of like that. <laughs> that well, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to the letter of the law, but that's it. Yeah, and there was like a freewheeling nature to it. Like, yeah, I don't know if you you've seen this, but there's a, a clip. Of, of Bill Tush interviewing Ted Turner, and it seems like that Ted Turner is basically floating this idea for the show on the air to him, uh-huh. and and he, he's saying like, well, how would you, you know, how would you put it together a show like that? He's like, well, we we need like to hire writers and stuff. And like, well, what'd you need? How how fast can you put it together? And like, it seems like they're negotiating this while they're they're talking this interview, and it just mm-hmm. seemed like maybe some of that was staged, but. You could believe it. I mean, until even into the 80s when they had the big graphics and, and they were such a big channel, it didn't seem like totally corporate. It seemed like its own thing. And yeah. part of it was like the, the original programming they had. Part of it was the, the promotions and all that kind of thing. But it just had like its own identity. And for me, it was a big deal because, okay, this is cable TV. I mean, when it first growing up, I think two Channel 2 was HBO. Channel 3 was the PBS. Channel 4 was a, was a cable or was a local access with like a bulletin board kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Then we had 5 was New York. WNYW, 6 was the NBC. I think Channel 7 later became something else, but it was USA for a while. Mm. Then you had Channel 8 was like a, a fuzzy station from Altoona. <laughs> Channel 9 was WR. Channel 10, CBS. 11, WPIX from New York. And then 12, I think, became CNN, and 13 became ESPN. So we had like some base channels, but then when TBS came in, that, that opened up a whole new world. And for me, it was mainly because it had uh, NWA wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> And, and this is something else I want to talk about, but the one thing that was distinct about was it was on every Saturday at 6.05, and that leads us to Turner time. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that great innovation known as, as Turner time for TBS. Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of, it, it was kind of annoying, to be honest. Right. But Do they still do that? I don't think they do anymore. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, back in the TV guide... And, and supposedly that was one of the, the, the goals, it to somehow, give its own listings. Yeah, and right. it, it totally worked. Right. Everything stood out, like, every single day. Even, like, Brady Bunch at 205, mm-hmm. you know, got its own listing. Uh, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. And it made everything a little bit more distinctive. <laughs> so every Saturday, and that's why I think it must have been, like, early 1986, maybe late 1985, is because the thing I was most interested in was World Championship Wrestling and... It grew out of Georgia Championship Wrestling, which was on TBS for years, and was a big ratings uh, winner for for Ted Turner. And uh-huh. we'll put uh, like a, a clip in the uh, in the playlist. But Vince McMahon bought that time slot from Georgia Championship Wrestling, and it was an event that was known as Black Saturday because everybody that was used to seeing this one kind of wrestling turn on their TVs and all of a sudden saw Vince McMahon with his WWF, oh. which was not the kind of wrestling they were used to. Yeah, it flopped. And long story short, eventually Vince McMahon sold. Ted Turner, uh, the NWA Crockett Promotions, got the time slot back and it became 605 World Championship Wrestling on TBS. And then Ted Turner, several years later, bailed out uh, Crockett Promotions, was going bankrupt, and Ted Turner actually bought it, and it became World Championship Wrestling. But the reason he bought it was because he was he was a fan of wrestling himself. I don't know, maybe that's been overblown a little bit over the years. I mean, one thing is it made him money, mm-hmm. and that's why he loved it. And But he knew that they the station got a lot of feedback on professional wrestling, and it was, again, kind of the counterpoint to uh, the WWF that we talked about on our Saturday Night's Main Event episode, the slicker, uh, more polished, uh, more cartoonish product aimed at kids, while Southern Wrestling was more athletic-based, more realistic, and that was what Ted Turner's channel had. And it wasn't just the Saturday 605 show, but that was kind of the flagship for, for years. And like, I remember it also being on 
Saturday morning. Yeah, they, there was a Saturday morning show that was less popular, and they also had like Sunday show, and they expanded later. And uh, but like the flagship was like the six oh five Saturday show, and I got some of the syndicated programming on one of the Pennsylvania channels. But the TBS show that was like a big deal getting that, and it was it was two hours two hours a week. Except when the Braves uh, were starting at right. seven thirty five, and then <laughs> we cut off, and I'd get annoyed at that. <laughs> And before World Championship Wrestling would be fishing with Orlando Wilson. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So I think I saw probably many of the last minute fishing with Orlando Wilson because Mm -hmm. I was tuning in to to see uh, 605 Wrestling. There at 604. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, the other thing I'll say is uh, I I love the wrestling on there. And they also started the Clash of Champions which is like a um, kind of like their equivalent of Saturday night's main event. The first one was like on, an, on a weekend afternoon, but then it became like a usually a weekday evening kind of thing. And, and my friends and I were all about that. You'd get like a, a two, two and a half hour show with like actual good quality matches, not the regular TV quality matches. And it would be like a huge event and it would be live. So that was a big deal back then. So for me, TBS was one of my favorite channels. That would be once we got it, it was almost like indispensable. Not yeah. so much because of the reruns, although the reruns were cool, but because of the wrestling. Right. And the cartoons. Yeah. Like you mentioned, that that's a, a great cartoon block. And I think USA, like I remember my friends always talking about the USA Cartoon Express, which is kind of similar. Like they'd have, you'd have like, what, three or four hours in the morning of cartoons right. all thrown together. But they were like way inferior cartoons usually. Yeah. You know, maybe like, they'd be like the lesser Hanna-Barbera shows, like the Hair Bear Bunch or something like that. <laughs> But TBS would be showing like Tom and Jerry and yeah, Bugs Bunny. Exactly. And, you know, just kind of throwing them all together. I, I kind of like that. Yeah. It's like I think on, on other channels too, like when, when channels would buy these cartoon packages and throw them together. So you'd get like, coming up at four o'clock, you know, the Tom and Jerry Popeye hour. It's right. Like, what are the, they, ha- they don't have anything in common with no. each other. And you'd see some like generic, like key art of Tom and Jerry looking like they're smiling at Popeye or something, you know, like yeah. they're friends. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think the turn- the TBS one later was called that like i saw a reference to a tom and jerry hour or something but it's great because if you got if you needed a break from the unrelenting violence of tom and jerry (laughs) you could get the unrelenting violence of the three stooges (laughs) a little something for everyone yeah yep and then some you know little rascals yeah and uh soften it up (laughs) <laughs> so so you don't remember uh did you did you watch night tracks because i, I did enjoy it i night did tracks. yeah once i got into that i remember not watching it while it was on but like taping it overnight mm. and then kind of fast forwarding it yeah you know just looking for the thing i wanted to see but it was pure music because and i we might not that might have been one of the periods where we didn't have cable so that would have been the only way huh. to see music videos yeah yeah us. i think i think eventually and that, that had kind of a longer run than I, I would have thought actually i think it went on i think it started like in the around 84 or so and went on like into the early 90s maybe it was pure videos as i recall just voiceover announcers there weren't like on-air vjs right, and yeah. there weren't like interviews and other segments like a night flight or something like that but it was on like the whole night right? yeah yeah it was it was on late and i think maybe like mtv killed that off like the, with making exclusive deals for videos and uh, probably made it harder for them to get like the hottest videos and stuff like that but yeah it was a cool thing and they'd have like night tracks chart busters and like these variations of night tracks it was like a whole a little franchise they had there but that was kind of another thing that i always thought was cool about tbs that night tracks yeah speaking of maybe not exclusive deals but in some of the reading i did it said one of the ways he built the channel initially was by sort of a, a taking on you know syndication rights to the shows that the, the other local channels didn't want hmm. or you know after like a year would go up and the local channels didn't want to spend money on the the new big thing that they had for that year he would just take it I kept seeing mentions of Star Trek being on there. I don't remember that. Like, I remember Channel 11 having Star Trek, like, mm-hmm. showing it Saturday afternoons. Mm-hmm. But it could have been on both. I don't, yeah. I just That's not my memory of how I watch Star Trek. Yeah. That didn't seem like a... T- a you know, I, I didn't have as much TBS as you did. Yeah. That didn't seem like a, a Star Trek show to me, like... Well, Gilligan's Lost in Space, group, I think, was on there, maybe, but... Well, and, and you know what else? Uh, we kind of touched on this, but uh, the movies, they did show a lot of movies, and one thing is Westerns, right? Yeah, I mean, like I associate them with like a lot of westerns, and I remember seeing a lot of promos for. I didn't really watch like John Wayne movies, especially right. like some of the old westerns, like Rio Bravo or whatever. Yeah, I, I didn't watch a lot of movies on television back then, but I would see the promos all the time when I'm watching other stuff on TBS, and it seemed like they really pushed those those pretty hard. Yeah, that sounds right. And I remember I, I don't know if it's there or another channel showing like 
there a period of seeing like I don't know Jerry Lewis movies and Marx mm. Brothers movies and a lot on somewhere. I, I was going to say Abbott and Casella, but I don't know if I ever saw their movies. I remember uh, growing up, uh, we had like one of the New York channels that WPIX showed Abbott and Costello a lot. Yeah. And the Three Stooges. I mean, it's, it's funny because like a lot of the stuff I, like I said, I knew from other channels. Right. And then TBS's distinctive thing was, was kind of some other things for me. Like Andy Griffith. Like I didn't actually watch Andy Griffith that much as a kid, but I do remember it being on TBS, you know, all the time. And yeah. Kind of a staple of that. What about the, uh, the sports on, on TBS? Uh, we watched the, we watched a lot of Braves and the Hawks, yeah. it, you know, the, Braves, I certainly remember the announcers. The, you know, you get your Skip Carey, hmm. Ernie Johnson Sr., not to be confused with Ernie Johnson Jr., who's still yeah. broadcasting, but who had been a pitcher for the Braves. Pete Van Weeren, the professor, hmm. and John Sterling, who I think is still a big deal in New York, right? Yeah, he's still like the radio voice of the... Yeah, and they, they would games. do the, you know, switching back and forth between radio and TV, so you would get different teams during a game, or if you happen to be out somewhere, you would hear if, if my dad or if we had it on the car radio you would hear one of those teams and then you might see them on tv yeah. when you got home but you know and, and then the uh the hawks and then of course tnt pretty quickly had nba stuff right yeah am i mistaken or did the braves uh crew weren't they notorious for being quote-unquote the world's most dangerous announced team <laughs> maybe i'm <making> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe i'm thinking of somebody else they yeah. weren't quite that okay no it seemed to me that they had a good chemistry. They did, yeah. I remember did. not being a John Sterling fan. Yeah. But, you know, they had to keep it entertaining. <laughs> yeah. I, Skip Carey, in particular, I remember being able to uh, to carry a lot of dull innings with yeah. you know, talking about ridiculous stuff. I, I remember them as being a very low-key yes. team. But, you know, for baseball, you kind of have to be for 160 games, 62 games a year. Yeah, Skip you, Carey was, like, compared to his dad, Harry Carey, was... Yeah. Definitely more laid back, sort <laughs> True. Of. and seemed southern to me, but I guess it wasn't. Mm. But and Ernie Johnson, I think, definitely was from that area, maybe. But I think he played for the Milwaukee Braves too. Yeah, yeah. Atlanta had started out as uh, you know from Milwaukee, and then you know they had Hank Aaron yeah. uh, broke the home run record in Atlanta, but they, they didn't have a huge tradition of baseball. No, of, of Atlanta Braves baseball, but. Right. I mean, now they're kind of like an institution, but yeah. TNT got the NBA, but also TBS did, and um, for a while they were pretty much the main cable home. I think of the NBA, like in the mid '80s, like That's kind right. of right around the time when Jordan became big. Yeah, they were. It was you know CBS was kind of still the main broadcast partner, but yeah, TBS because NBA had been on like USA Network and ESPN, but then I really remember it as being big on TBS and something that they really promoted, including, and I'm going to put this in the playlist: the TBS at the hoop. Yeah. Promos to the tune of At the Hop. Right. I think maybe one of my uh, main reasons for wanting to do this episode is so I have an excuse to look up the At the Hop uh, commercials and put this in the playlist. Right. Like you can you can jam it, you can slam it yeah. at the hop. Um, Superstation is the way to see the NBA at the hop. Yeah. Or at the hoop. At the TBS hoop. Yeah. at the hoop. So a couple of things. Now I'm, I'm thinking the Hawks. They might not have been on TBS ever. At some point, they moved to Channel 46. Okay. When, like, when I was watching, I don't remember them really promoting Hawks games. It was more yeah. like a national right. TBS thing. So maybe because of the national, they couldn't have the, mm. the Hawks on there. Maybe they never did. I don't know. But John Sterling did the Hawks for a while. Mm. And, Even and on Walt, other, it, John Sterling, I think it was John Sterling and you know, Walt Clyde Frazier did the mm. Hawks. And actually, which is funny, like John Sterling and Walt Clyde Frazier now to think of them doing like Atlanta basketball yeah. years ago. But and like they had Dominique Wilkins for a while. They, they were actually yeah. like almost a national team because Dominique was so like awesome. Right. Like they would get to show some of the ancillary all star stuff, right? The like the slam dunk yes, contest. Exactly. Yeah, that. the slam dunk and the three point I think was kinda like their deal. Yeah. They turned that into a big thing. I th- I think the reason it became popular was really them and, and the fact that they had like guys like Larry Bird would be in the and Jordan would be competing in those but yeah yeah I remember those a lot with like their Bob Neal Bob Neal yeah was one of their main Craig Sager sports guys yeah yeah I mean that's where the younger Ernie Johnson got yeah his start and he's still doing that NBA stuff and I think Rick Barry must have been with them for yeah, a while yeah, too yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my brother and I used to make fun of him <laughs> <laughs> we found uh, him him exceedingly annoying for some reason. <laughs> I don't think you need to add the for some reason qualifier. I think a lot of people share that opinion, but yeah. but uh, he was kind of a divisive figure. But yeah, yeah, and and also um, I remember another thing that he was sort of mocked for the Goodwill Games. Yes, uh, which you know started in the '80s and and went all the way up till 2001. Wow, 
Although, boy, it could have fooled me that they still had one in 2001. But it was Turner's way of kind of like trying to get away from the politics of, well, he was a big globalist and still is. And he thought like bring teams together or countries together and sports would lessen the chance of nuclear war, yeah. frankly. And it was the time of lots of boycotts and yeah, Olympic boycotts. Right. So they, they had the first one like in Moscow, and then they went back to the United States for the next one. I think they had one in Seattle. And uh, he really tried to push that. And, and yeah. I think there was le- legitimate competition and um, like real stars, like track stars were competing in there. But I don't know if anybody ever really fully took it seriously. Although... I'm sure the athletes appreciate having another like venue and, and kind of yeah. a world stage, but it didn't seem to really catch on the way they expected. I think he lost a lot of money on that, but he put his money where his mouth is. And he, he gave, gave himself like you know a lot of programming for TBS, if nothing else. Yeah. It was kind of like a made-for-TV event in a way. Right, yeah. Put his money where his mouth is. Yeah. It's, it's a big amount of money where his big mouth is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it had a big target. I know you wanted to talk about some of their original programs, which I don't remember. Yeah, I... Uh, yeah, I, I know they existed. I just didn't watch them they had a weird i think one of the most distinctive things that they did was they they had like a block of family sitcoms for a while they got like uh the new leave it to beaver which started out as still the beaver on the disney channel yeah somehow turner got the rights to that and they put the new leave it to beaver on tbs and since leave it to beaver itself was a big hit i can understand that and it seemed to pretty much fit in so that was like a a quasi original i mean it was new programming but it was based on an existing property and, and do you remember it all, New Leave it to Beaver? That I, I do, it. yeah, a little bit. I didn't really watch it at the time, but I watched a little bit of it in preparation for this. And man, that that <laughs> it's, it's not terrible, but right. like I think the main mistake they made was just um, it wasn't different enough. Yeah. Like like um, in particular, Eddie Haskell's kid is just like Eddie Haskell. Right. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be funnier if you had Eddie Haskell's kid be totally opposite, and then like they were going after each other, like he's trying to always do the right thing, and, and his you know, his dad was frustrated because he just didn't get along with them and stuff. Yeah. Instead of having them compete with each other, right, or like try to outdo each other, I, I don't know. And Wally and Beaver both had kids. They did, and one of them was divorced, and uh, the other, I think Beaver was, I think Beaver was divorced, maybe, and he had to live move back in with his mom geez. or something. I and mean, that's kind of a <laughs> depressing. It is, and of course Ward's dead, right? So even an adult Beaver or an adult Wally couldn't live up to him. So right. Yeah, <laughs> and they had you know, in our minds, I think just you know that I don't think they had the, those actors had the same presence, right? Which is not a knock, and just you know, but they got Frank Bank back to play Lumpy, Lumpy well, Rutherford. Well, there you go. So <laughs> when he signed, everybody else, yeah, everybody else put pen to paper. Plus, I mean, did they still talk like they did in the fifties, or did they, or sixty, what, whatever period that took? <laughs> a little bit. I mean, they weren't calling you know people creeps. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it was a little modernized, but yeah. I mean, it, it seemed like you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it was trying to make a, like a wholesome uh, throwback and nostalgia was very big. It always is. Yeah. But I think in the mid eighties, it was kind of a good time maybe for, for kind of a throwback to that era. But well, uh, and like uh, the original leave it to beaver suffered as soon as he got a little older. Yeah. It, yeah. So the idea of him being an adult. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Then you got to find some other kid who's got his magic. Yeah. Which didn't happen. No, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Whatever kid played yeah. Beaver well, stand in, but yeah. And, and I, I so I watched like an early episode, and then I watched like the credits for like uh, like three or four. It lasted more longer than I thought. And then the later season, you can see like the same actors. The kid actors are so much older. It's like oh wow, oh, that that didn't take long, you know. And yeah, like, yeah. So eh, I don't think it was an artistic success, but I can see why they tried it, and I guess they they ran for several years with it. Yeah. So I mean, and it's good that those actors got some more life out of their careers yeah i mean i, I know tony dow was still working yeah i think he still is like a, he was a director too i think and yeah it wasn't eddie haskell wasn't he a cop or something yes yes he was <laughs> and i i gotta say that character translated pretty well to adulthood i mean yeah he was still pretty you know the same kind of smarmy and kind of right but uh so that was maybe the, the highest profile of these these family originals they also had a show like down to earth uh with some kind of like angel come back to life <laughs> premise or something that i don't remember watching that yeah. And then there was the Caitlin's or some kind of like a soap opera kind of thing. The other one I remember was like Rocky Road. And I remember the theme song, but it was, again, tell me if you think this is a hilarious premise. <laughs> so apparently like the parents die. <laughs> uh-huh. Off to a good start. And the surviving kids are, are decide to carry on their beachside ice cream shop uh, without the parents. Oh, sure. Uh, with, you know, some wacky local characters. Uh, like Dick Butkus or something. Yeah. Well, close. <laughs> But, <laughs> yeah. So, 
I mean, one thing, and, and the the talent is mixed on some of these. And one thing you can tell, like, they're made for cable in the 80s. Yeah. These shows kind of fascinate me. They're very, very cheap. Right. I mean, the, the production values are not good, and, and the, the acting is mixed. But probably yeah. one of the most standout performers, he, on his, uh, he's got a YouTube channel where he was good enough to apparently post, like, all the episodes of this show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... You know, major ups to him, and he he does stand out. He kind of looks distinctive, and he seems to have more charisma than anybody else in the cast. So good for him. Yeah. Uh, but the show itself is, you know, it's, it's just kind of cheap and it's inoffensive. Right. But I guess like, it was worth a shot. But they paired that with New Leave It to Beaver, I think, for a while. Like cheaper than? Well, I'm sure cheaper than, but it's to me it sounds like it would be the equivalent of sort of like the tween shows on Disney, Nick at Night. Yes. Uh, or Nick at Nickelodeon. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a pretty fair fair thing, but. To me, they look even cheaper than that, yeah. especially relative to probably what else was on TV at the time. It really does stand out as like yeah, budget, yeah, you know, conscious kind of show. Cheaper than Small Wonder. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Now we're finding some more common ground here. <laughs> yeah. Because if we're comparing cable originals to syndication originals, first run syndication originals, right. well, that's a little bit more fair than cable originals to like broadcast originals, which yeah. there's a big difference. But yeah, kind of more in that that vain i guess but speaking of cheap originals maybe there's a good time to segue into tush yes yes let's uh let's talk yeah. about uh, sketch tush. comedy show tush from uh, 1981 yeah i don't remember this which is not surprising because it was on late night and i remember bill tush of course but and i don't think i'd heard of it until jan hooks died and then got mentioned in hmm. some of her obituaries so that might be the most <coughs> notable thing about it that uh, jan hooks and the uh what Bonnie and Terry Turner, who mm-hmm. they all, of course, went on to SNL. The mm-hmm. Turners went on as writers, correct? Yeah. And, and then they created Third Rock from the Sun. Right. But they were all a part of the show. Yeah. Part of the cast and uh, part of the writing. And I think the Turners produced it. I don't, no relation to Ted as right, far as right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of, I looked up the other actors just to see. And a lot of them seem to, you know, still be doing stuff. Some of them seem to be kind of regional. Two of them were in the movie Six Pack. Oh, wow. With, with Kenny Rogers? And Aaron Gray. Yeah. And, and a young Diane Lane. Nice. And one of them, his only other role was a character I don't remember from Twin Peaks named Cappy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and some other people, that you know, some interest. just, they're not people I recognized or anything. Though. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you did that because there was a huge cast in this. I mean, yeah. I started writing down the names and then I yeah. regretted doing it because it went on forever. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the list of names at the beginning and of the And then cast. the last... Through, like four go by two at a time really quickly. Yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's maybe they're the featured players. Yeah. <laughs> but so we just, you know, saw one episode. So I don't know if they always had, like there, there was a, like a main set that looked like a hotel hallway or something. Yeah. I don't know if that's always the case. I think maybe it was. I've seen some other clips. Uh, okay. And I will say to anybody that's interested, I've, I've since found out that a lot of this, it's maybe a little bit harder to find, but you can find like a lot of a lot of the sketches at least online. So if you're interested in, in pursuing this, yeah, it, it's easy to find. Well, maybe not precisely if you're looking for a specific episode, but you can find a lot of this material. So I, yeah. I think what I guess what I'm trying to say is I think this episode was fairly typical. It seems like of some of the other ones, right? Like I think maybe even the fact that it had a theme. You know, Bill Tush is not an actor. I mean, he's a broadcaster. Yeah, that was his background, and but he, he, I mean, he does okay. Yeah, I mean, in, he has an irreverent sense of humor, which yes. I didn't really know about from necessarily from showbiz today. I just kind of thought he was a wise ass. Yeah, <laughs> but from like the like the news background and kind of the stuff he was doing, he he showed kind of like a didn't take himself too seriously. It seemed yeah. like. Whereas later, I, I think I kind of assumed maybe just kind of his, his delivery in some of the showbiz today, I thought maybe he was the kind of guy that did take himself kind of seriously. Uh, <laughs> but this is kind of like a more of an eye opener. I didn't know he had this this side to him. Yeah, and sometimes he's just playing sort of a straight man and mm-hmm. the, the things. To me, Jan Hooks stood out, but I don't know if she stood out because I knew who she was or because she was in almost every sketch. Yeah, or, or, or just because she you know was already showing signs of her talent. But I have the same feeling. I would argue that I bet it's it's very very possible that she was in almost every sketch because of her talent and that yeah. she stood out right away yeah and i, I always think she was uh, one of the better parts of saturday night live and, and yeah she was definitely commands your attention on this too yeah to me the most memorable sketch was the where she's playing a sort of tammy faye baker kind of character yeah. and uh, although they never explicitly say it's religious mm-hmm. just keep using the word inspirational which yeah i mean is code for that, but maybe because of being in the South, they were, I mean, that was the most Southern feeling sketch. And uh, yet yeah. 
uh, it was just interesting. They never quite mentioned God or Jesus, but and apparently that was a re- recurring character. It seemed like it, yeah, yeah. And didn't she do to Tammy Faye Baker on yeah. SNL? Yes, yeah, yeah. But that was a you know that was a pretty funny, a reasonably funny sketch. There's no audience or laugh track or anything, which is uh, I don't know why I found that strange because I'm sure there are other shows like that. SCTV didn't have a laugh track, did it? I think maybe it did at some point. Yeah. Kids in it's, the hall, portraying parts. But, I mean, but this in the hall had an audience. To me, this kind of looked like something like Fridays, which had yes. an audience. Or sort of, it sort of has that look like Friday night, uh, Fridays or Saturday, some Saturday night, night but it, it almost adds to that more to kind of like low budget, surreal quality. The right. fact that they're using these like real minimalist common sets. Yeah. Like the hotel set, there's no reason for that to be like the default set. No, I guess but it is. they, they kind of like would go in and out of doors. It yeah. Was, it was sort of like a, a way to create segues. There, there you go. Yeah. 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 But uh, that and the lack of audience uh, just really kind of gives it this kind of weird detachment. Yeah. Which is it's kind of cool, but <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's it's definitely interesting. I, can, I mean, I guess we could talk about some of the other sketches quickly. So the theme was education. Mm-hmm. There was a bartender, a, a, like a bartending school sketch that, where Tush is playing a character who wants, he's trying to hit on women and they don't give him any attention so then they show a commercial for this bartending school and then he goes to the bartending school and yeah gets a very quick lesson right <laughs> and then he's bartending and the the guy from the bartending school is like a homeless guy at the bar yeah <laughs> or the the guy from the commercial so right you know it was an okay idea yeah but i think the best part of that might have been they had a list of graduates of the school and they were all just like names of booze yeah you know, Budweiser, like and, Jack Daniels, yeah, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it was it was sort of like there was a good idea in there that that maybe it went on just like a tad too long. Yeah, they didn't quite have enough there. But I'm, I'm curious. I imagine they were throwing this together every week, like right. Like I, I would have thought that maybe they did this like every month or something, but I think they were doing this every week. So yeah. it must have been something else to put all this together. And I'll bet everybody in the cast. I didn't really check the writing credits. I didn't see. I bet they were all credits, like, but... yeah, okay. I bet they were all like writing the show together I'm and sure, stuff too. Yeah. So and and Tush was doing like a weird voice, but otherwise he was Bill Tush. Yeah, there's a thing called Scholars for Dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, which like some kind of a, like, game show kind of set. Yeah, but it was set in the hotel hallway. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pitted Jan Hooks as a cheerleader, high school cheerleader. It was high school, right? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, because yeah. There was there's some, some risque. <laughs> Yeah, there's some innuendo. And I, I'm not sure if that was Bonnie Turner or who that was. but uh, Yeah, I don't know who it was. Uh, as sort of like a nerd. Okay, yeah. I guess would be the... It didn't make a lot of sense. The host was hitting on Jan Hoax's character. Yeah, that was kind of the main thing of it. Yeah, and they would just... Whatever answer they gave, he would give them $10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> didn't really seem to like it seemed to be pitting well the nerd would be mad about it and she was but then she got an answer for some stupid thing so it didn't really go anywhere no but not everything has to go anywhere but yeah a lot of these kind of felt like skits that would go in the 12 30 to 1 o'clock slot in Saturday Night Live yeah that were like throughout the whole show in this one (laughs) the Tammy Jean which we already mentioned the uh, sort of evangelist thing so her character it's her and a woman plays organ and a guy with a guitar and then Bill Tush is her think her husband but and then a guy came on as a guest who wanted help with his parking tickets yeah he had heard she was friendly with a, a lot of cops <laughs> <laughs> i mean i could kind of i kind of respected that the concept of it but yeah. I, that, that character just isn't that interesting to me so i didn't right. really get into this one either i think yeah probably back then it was more a little more cutting yeah yeah good point yeah it just seemed more it seemed fairly well executed but uh then there's a weird thing or like bill tush it was in the it was in the hallway again where he's like visiting his old high school. Yeah, yeah, that was and everyone was just treating him like crap. Yeah, that was kind of bizarre. <laughs> and then a man played his old teacher and Tush popped the balloons that were there for her breasts. Yeah. The, then that segued into the last sketch, it was like this graduation sketch. Yeah, and I kind of enjoyed this actually. <laughs> I think it went on a bit too long. Yeah. But like the uh like the the resident wacky big guy that they had yes. to, to to give his big speech that that actually I actually laughed at that several times I thought that was entertaining yeah that was he was like a bitter r- drunk writer yeah <laughs> he was like he was spelling what was he spelling out grad was grad yeah yeah which t- so Tush played the principal yeah and he had already done that in a more normal sort of sentimental graduation way inspirational right like. I think G stands for I don't like remember. goals or yeah, something, yeah. something like that. Or, you know. Right. Yeah. And then that there. Uh, oh, Ralph Nader was supposed to give the speech, but he had car trouble. So. Yeah. Yeah. So this guy came up and topical joke. He just like tore into everything. Yeah. 
And, I, and at one point he's like, "Hey, I don't have anything for A." Yeah, <laughs> I laughed at that. <laughs> yeah, that was that was kind of entertaining. It was. Uh, there were a lot of weird names in that. There were, yeah, like like just some risque of the... again. Weird, uh, or I can't. Remember. The coach's name was yeah, it was something uh, something Reamer. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. The librarian was Mrs. Seaman, and yeah. uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that was, it was kind of odd, but yeah, it's kind of ambitious to have uh, you're doing a weekly show and to have it a theme. Yeah, and really, education did tie everything was tied to edu- education on this show. I guess so. I mean, they did a pretty good job. <laughs> I mean, the first one was the most the most stretch, and that was like a, a, a like a school that you could go to. So even yeah. that kind of fits in with it. So yeah. I kind of give them fair play, although I don't know if the Tammy Jean. Yeah, really. that, now that I think about it. <laughs> Well, she's the recurring character. Yeah. They they have to build right. around her, not the People other way around. Loved. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really only about five skits. Uh, yeah. I think. I think it was an hour show. Yeah, it? I think it was. Yeah. And then they had uh, oh, musical yeah. performance at the end. It's Bobby Bear. Bobby Bear. Yeah. Instead of like working him into the middle, they just stick him right at the end <laughs> and roll the credits and start over. Playing the credits like what? Total lack of respect for Bobby Bear. I know. <laughs> but we got good news and bad news, Bobby. <laughs> You get to be on a TV show on the Superstation. Yeah. They're going to roll the credits over here. Yeah. Did I get to play my whole song? <laughs> yeah, we think so. Yeah, so Bobby Bear, and then the, the credits, and the one thing I, that I thought was interesting, I, I didn't understand this, but uh, special thanks to Bob Neal was in the yeah. credits. <laughs> that seemed kind of random. Like, you know, he's a professional broadcaster, a yeah. big sports guy. and Maybe he helped them out. Yeah. I, I'm just curious what he what he did to help them out, or maybe just give them a... Yeah, kind word or two when they needed it. Also, Bill Tush, what was Bill Tush's voice is mechanically reproduced. <laughs> was that, I, I don't know Something I... was mechanically reproduced, and I had seen that on one of these other YouTube clips, like mm. that, like just that, like printed under the. This has been mechanically reproduced or something like some. Huh. I think it was some in the the one in the credits was like an in joke. Okay, but I don't know what why you had to tell people. That yeah. And that a television show had been mechanically reproduced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing that's kind of distinctive is that it had the, this kind of like like the logo of the show, mm-hmm. just you know, like his name and like this kind of whimsical music that yeah. they they had kind of like for the the bumpers and stuff like right. that. Yeah, kind of uh, gave it its little all these flavor. photos of wacky characters. Yeah, just kind of added to this this thing. I mean, this was this is interesting. I mean, I wouldn't need to to get a whole uh, season set of this, but. No. I'm glad to see it because I, I never even knew about this until now. Yeah, that's an interesting curiosity. I yeah, and and I think again, like, I'd say pretty ambitious. I mean, for like one channel without like full network backing that could just put on a show every week, a uh, little variety show. Yeah, sketches and music. Well, and, and it speaks to how highly Ted Turner thought of Bill Tush. It does, yeah. Which I think it came from those wacky news shows. And yeah. Go. Oh, wow, why don't you do a comedy show? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it was interesting. Uh, yeah. And I, yeah, I think Jan Hook's clearly the the standout from the the performers, and it, it's kind of cool to see her. And you don't hear about SNL people coming from the South. Yeah, no, it's like no, second I maybe city. she went to California before that, or yeah, or, you know, in between. But but that all the three people went managed to get to SNL within a few years of this. Is, right, right. That's something. Yeah, something distinctive, and and somebody not from the usual the usual sources. So yeah, yeah good for them. Yeah, another interesting TBS uh, experiment. Like, not all their original programming endured, and, and no. maybe much of it didn't. <laughs> but at least they were out there trying some things and yeah, putting a few things out there at a time when... And again, uh, to put this into perspective, for some of our younger uh, listeners, mm-hmm. our 2 to 11 de- demographics... No, especially person, those, yeah. yeah. Uh, back then... A now, TV is a box. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the thing you watch YouTube on. Yes. Is it, yeah. <laughs> uh, cable TV now, the, the, the shows that win all the awards are cable TV originals, but... Like back when we were growing up, Mike, cable TV was the home of reruns, movies, and maybe sports. Yeah. But it was not common at all to have to expect to to turn it to a cable station, see some kind of original show. It was definitely yeah. the exception. Right. And now, like any cable channel that does it, they spend years doing the re- building up to that. Yeah. Well, maybe not now, but like all the ones we think of started out as mostly reruns. Yeah. Like FX was mostly reruns. Yes. With some weird live program. Yeah, exactly. Like maybe the exception would be you do some kind of live talk and maybe variety, but mostly talk format like like FX did. Yeah. And, and Although, frankly, FX is still mostly reruns. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, what, what gets it, it's, it's probably renewed and gets its subscription fees is 
the bulk is probably its original programming. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it would be pretty easy to ditch if it was just two and a half men or whatever. Right, yeah. But two and a half men will fill out the schedule, yes. Yeah. And even, of course, TBS is mostly Bing Bang, Big Bang Theory. Yeah, but. yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of another programming thing. Like, now they got these blocks of shows they will have maybe four or five like TBS now is Endless Friends and Big Bang Theory yeah whereas back in the day you could say yeah it was Endless Annie Griffith but maybe they'd show two episodes of Annie Griffith but they had a whole lineup of these things that we I mean you wouldn't sit there and usually it went one to five in the afternoon it wouldn't be Andy Griffith they'd right. have some variety in there I guess I mean does TBS have originals right now uh, they do like I mean, um, yeah, they have Conan but it seems like they've got these short kind of sitcoms like there's the, isn't the one with like Daniel Radcliffe uh Steve Buscemi uh, oh, was a TBS thing. Oh, on TV? Okay. And like... Because some of that stuff's on True, too. Okay. Uh, it, it, like, it seemed like it came and went, and I was like, how is this not a bigger deal that Harry Potter and Steve Buscemi had this TV show? And, yeah. Like Search Party and uh, the Wyatt Cenex show. Right, yeah, and, yeah. And some of these ones, but it didn't seem like anything's really... I don't know what their big breakout hit is right now, except like Full Frontal. Right, yeah. And you know, Conan, it seems like they've got this reputation for comedy, but I don't know if they've really developed any real strong breakout comedies. Have yeah. They? Like TNT has dramas. Yeah. They know drama. Yes, they do. And even those haven't really. Yeah. Which one shows Claws? Claws is TNT. Okay. Claws in like Animal Kingdom right now. And yeah, TBS, I mean, I think you're hard pressed to come up with what, I mean, there's maybe a big one that we're missing, but. Right. I don't think they have like a huge hit right now that is American driving dad people. dad right now. <laughs> There's, well, they do make new episodes. Yeah, so. yeah. So, I mean, uh, technically that is. Yeah, I mean, actually, well, we have, well, they, they spawn like uh, Cartoon Network, yeah. Adult Swim, and it seems right. like that's where kind of comedy went a lot. And then TBS kind of tried to rebrand and, and kind of get back to sitcoms, and then they kind of went to like edgy comedies. I guess that's kind of their brand now is like quirky comedies, but. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, uh, it just it just doesn't doesn't have much of an identity to me anymore. No, no. And TNT has the NBA side, and TBS is, uh, yeah. They don't even have the Warner or sold the Braves, so. Yeah, they, they do have, like, during the playoffs, they get some playoff baseball on TBS, I think. Uh -huh. and, and, well, actually, in recent years, they've had, they did have, like, a game of the week, like a Sunday afternoon game of the week, like a non-exclusive baseball game each Sunday or something. But, so they've had some regular season baseball and things like that. Over the years, they had SEC football years ago, and they used to show some bowl games. I mean, TNT had the NFL for a while, but, yeah, and right now it's uh, NBA and maybe some drama is TNT, but and TNT used to be pretty cool when it first started too. Yeah, I mean they had like all these old shows and MGM TV shows and Outer Limits and but again way out of our era. But we're talking out of the era at this point. But we didn't mention our the other Turner channel that used to be around Turner South. Ah, Turner South, yes, the regional cable channel. Yeah, like and in a way that was kind of a reaction probably to to Superstation TBS becoming more homogenized. Uh, yeah. So you'd exactly. put some of the original shows that might have had a home, like like a Fishing with Orlando Wilson, right. would go to or Turner South probably by that yeah. time, right? Probably, yeah. I mean, I like don't... Southern Cooking Shows. Southern Cooking Shows, Interact Atlanta. Oh, yeah. What was it? There was a wrestling one. Yeah, the, the WCW Dusty Rhodes. Classics. The yeah. Classics. <laughs> Hosted by Dusty Rhodes. <laughs> kind of repurposing old uh, matches, yeah. Yeah. And... So that I guess that was before. Or he's WWE bought them out at some point, right? Yes. Although this is early two thousands, so yeah. So after that's after Turner sold to Warner, but right. Yeah, but he still had a say in what was. Yeah, going I on. think that was like in nineteen ninety six was when Time Warner yeah. bought them out, pretty much, and yeah, predated the AOL. Yeah, Oof. just a series of. I mean, it made sense for Warner to kind of get back their library and some of the assets they have, and and, and have it all be on one banner. So that that's actually like a corporate merger that made sense. But boy, right. it, looking back, it's it's kind of a shame that that Turner went away like that. And I think Ted Turner often said, hey, "I wish I didn't sell out." It's like, well, yeah. you did. You know, you right. made a lot of money <laughs> off it. So yeah, but I guess he lost some during the AOL period. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I like he, he couldn't buy it. He didn't have enough money to buy it back. Yeah. He was kind of like forced out of some things. But he is know. still the biggest single landholder in the United States. So. Well, that's that's something. You know, I don't think he's really, by most people's standards, he's not hurting. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Although, as you did allude to, he does have like, yeah. like a rare form of like body dementia that, right. like pretty debilitating. And that's why, kind of why he hasn't been in the public as much in recent years. Yeah. I always thought that like the, the, I was very surprised that he was willing to kind of like step out of the limelight for a while even before illness, because, I mean, yeah. this guy that had a really high-profile life and seemed to have, like, a huge ego and right. for good and bad and like being in the spotlight. And then it but it seems like he, he sat out, like, a whole lot of the 2000s, but I guess he was focusing on philanthropy and yeah. very concerned. We, we didn't mention Captain Planet. That's right. started just probably around the, the in the edge of our time frame. But yeah. That was kind of like an original 
That was was that part of the launch of Cartoon Network, or I think maybe it was. I, I, I seem to remember it being on TBS though, because I, I I seem to remember being really annoyed by it on yeah. TBS, and just th- <laughs> thought it was totally like bogus that they they made a show based around this like ecological message, uh-huh. uh, and then tried to promote the the heck out of it. But yeah, but I mean, say what you will about Ted Turner, you might not agree with all those things, but again, he backed it, it up and put put all these things out there and created you know some of the most influential channels ever ever done. Yep. And even Turner Classic Movies is not as influential, but it's kind of like the unicorn, but nobody's replicated it. But that's what makes it so awesome, the fact that it's, it's so distinctive and still around. So so lots of lots of good memories uh, from from the old TBS. And, and I think uh, right. not not me in the 70s, but in the 80s, I, I watched a lot of TBS. So I think it was it was nice to, to kind of talk about it. And yeah. I think there aren't that many cable channels that we could talk about like this, but I think there's a few others. If anybody has any suggestions, uh, pass them along. But hopefully you've enjoyed us kind of covering like the, the history in some way of, of Turner Broadcasting. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all I got. Yeah, I think that's that's all uh, that's all I got, too. Check out the uh, the YouTube uh, playlist for this one. I think it's going to be a good one. And I'll be interested in that because I... I was having trouble finding what I wanted to find. Okay, I was a lot of co- a lot of commercial compilations, but then and those are interesting because you see the like the tail end or the you know the edits of whatever the, they were airing during. Oh, right, right. But you know sometimes I wanted to see something else. I'm not sure what I wanted to see, but yeah, there are only so many commercials you can watch. Yeah, in a two hour period <laughs> on YouTube. Yes. Unless it's in the form of our playlist, which might wind up being two hours of right. promos. <laughs> It'll be very entertaining. Yeah. But no, some of the things we've, specific things we've talked about, uh, I, I've located and, and they will be there for your viewing pleasure. So. Ah, good. All right. Look forward to that. And uh, we'll talk to you again. Yeah. We're in five minutes after again, maybe. This episode brought to you by Corporation Rock, the latest, greatest collection from KTEL. Pull on a headband, strap on an air guitar, and rock hard, but melodically, to mega hits from your favorite acts like Journey, Starship, Loverboy, Boston, and Kiss. Who could forget more greats like Chicago, 38 Special, and everybody's favorite REO Speedwagon? You'll get all these and more on 5 LPs, cassettes, or 8 tracks for only $19.99. As a bonus, we'll include this handy pocket mirror. Call now to order Corporation Rock. 1-800-555-BOTNS. That's 1-800-555-BOTNS. Join us next time for another exciting episode of Battle of the Network shows. Learn more, leave feedback, and suggest future episodes at battleofthenetworkshows.com. Follow us on Twitter at BatNetShows and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Battle of the Network Shows.